food bloggers. Hi, how are you today? Thank you so much for tuning in to the Eat Blog Talk podcast. This is the place for food bloggers to get information and inspiration to accelerate your blog's growth and ultimately help you to achieve your freedom, whether that's financial, personal, or professional. I'm Megan Porta, and I've been a food blogger for over 12 years. I understand how isolating food blogging can be at times. I'm on a mission to motivate, inspire, and most importantly, let each and every food blogger, including you, know that you are heard and supported. It's not always about how long you've been blogging. It's sometimes about what you did before you started blogging that matters. This episode is proof of that. Jen Zo joins me on the episode. She is from Greedy Girl Gourmet, and she talks about how her experience in business school translated into the blogging world and how that has helped her to succeed. This is episode number 378, sponsored by Rank IQ. You're going to love this one. Thanks for tuning in. Enjoy. Hey, awesome food bloggers. Before we dig into this episode, I have a really quick favor to ask you. Go to your favorite podcast player, go to eBlog Talk, scroll down to the bottom where you see the ratings and review section. Leave eBlog Talk a five-star rating if you love this podcast and leave a great review. This will only benefit this podcast. It adds value. And I so very much appreciate your efforts with this. Thank you so much for doing this. Okay, now on to the episode. I have Jen Zhou with me today. She is going to talk to us about translating what she learned at business school into the blogging world. Jen blogs about cooking up flavorful Southeast Asian recipes for her audience because she can't stand bland food. She also occasionally shares about the life of a food blogger. Jen, how are you today? It's so great to have you on the podcast. Hi, thanks for having me. I'm so excited to be here. I've listened to so many of your podcasts. It kind of feels like a milestone to be here, Ah. but I'm not a great public speaker. So, you know, if I have a brain spasm and I don't say anything or I say something totally weird, you know, forgive me and I will promise to say something useful after that. Well, you're not the only one. I have those often. So we're in the same boat and I'm sure everything will be great. So such a pleasure to have you here today. Before we get into this amazing topic, do you have a fun fact to share with us? Yes, I do. So because my topic was about the MBA, I thought I should have a fun fact related to the MBA. So I did my MBA at London Business School, which is obviously in London. And then as part of that, I took part in this entrepreneurship event called Pitch the Palace. And it was held in St. James Palace, which is one of the royal family's properties in London. Oh, my. Oh, that's so cool. Okay. Do you have any details about that experience that we could hear about that we would love? Uh, Well... So I, I was there with a British friend and I think, you know, he must have thought this is such a hillbilly because I told him, you know, this palace just looks like a really old house. Oh. <laughs> well, because you, you're expecting something like super grand right. for this palace, but really, you know, it's quite like a normal old house. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> I guess. Yeah. I mean, it can't, not everything can be grand like we imagine in our minds, right? Yep. Oh, that's awesome. Thank you for sharing that. Now we want to hear about business school and how you've translated what you've learned there into blogging, which I think is such a cool topic. Would you mind just starting by telling us what has been your journey with business school and then also just touch on your blogging journey as well? Okay. So, you know, if I say too many strenuous things about MBA, which is not related to blogging, do feel free to redirect me. But I went to MBA basically because I was kind of at this crossroads in my career and I just wanted to see what other options there were out there to explore and what the opportunities. And then somehow when I was at business school, I can't remember why, but I suddenly felt like, you know, I really wanted to be a blogger. I think maybe that was about the time when blogging was starting to explore on the scene and I could see that it was a great fit for myself because I've always loved creative stuff. So I've been selling my own like design since I was really young. But I knew that wasn't a viable career because it's not scalable. You know, if I sell, for example, my handmade jewelry, I can only sell the number of pieces I can produce in a month. And, you know, because I'm not superwoman, but it's, there's a limit to that number. So unless I want to like outsource production to somewhere else, which I think then takes you away from the fact that I want to do something creative because then it just becomes about managing somebody else doing the work. And then with blogging, I thought like it was amazing because you could do something creative, you know, you know, cooking or sharing a DIY tutorial. And then because there's no limit to the number of people you can reach with the internet, you know, your work is, there's no limit to how much you can scale up that piece of work. Okay, that's cool. Yeah, that's so true, right? Like you can only make so many pieces of jewelry before you're like dying and tired and not making much money in the end. So blogging is such a great way to fulfill that creativity. 
but also the world is your oyster. The sky's the limit with the amount of money you can make. So I love that you made that connection. Okay, so how did you, where did you go from there once you realized you wanted to dig into blogging? So uh, just to mention, so the other thing I really like about blogging is that it's actually the perfect marriage of like creativity and like business. Because, you know, blogging is a huge business. There's a lot of like strategy and business tactics behind the whole creative process. Oh gosh, that's so true. Yes. So then this is where I mentioned to you that my journey was a bit convoluted. So actually, this is not my first blog. So when I first started, I did a DIY blog because, you know, I, I made jewelry for sale. and It kind of seemed like natural. So then I did that for a while. And then I felt like I wasn't getting anywhere. So then I closed the blog, which I think was a big mistake because it actually was on BuzzFeed and it was on Timeout and whatnot, you know, so I regret doing that. And so then I rethought about it and I was thinking, you know, what can I do that is still creative within blogging, but I think has more potential. And then that's when I thought about food. So because I love food and to me, it's more than just eating, even though I do love eating too much, but mm -hmm. I think like food's about bringing people together. And, you know, it's just another form of being creative besides jewelry and there are more people interested in recipes than there are in jewelry and just for today I actually researched so I used to do like runway tutorials like how do you recreate this Prada earring and I searched that on key search and zero people in the whole world are looking for how to make a Prada earring <laughs> lots of people there so uh, you know I think the switch was a good choice yeah yeah food is I mean everyone needs food right and most people who consume food love food so I I just I think that was a really smart call. It's never going to go away. Food is only going to get more and more popular. So you made that decision to dig into food blogging. And when was that? So, okay. And this is, again, where it gets a bit complica complicated again. So I think, like, I told people that I wanted to be a food recipe blogger in 2017. It's because I saw that my Instagram account was open in 2017. And I think I got this re reply from everyone. Are you sure that blogs are still alive? Does anyone read a blog? And probably because, you know, I didn't have much success with my previous blog. I mean, to be fair, I got 20,000 views a month with the DIY blog, which I think was was okay. You know, it's not, it's not amazing, but I think I could probably have built it up higher if I knew then what I, I know now. Sure. So, but because, you know, of of my perception that it wasn't going anywhere or I, I don't know what I was doing. I think I just had so many side hustles. So it took me another two years before I actually started a, the actual blog. And then uh, it took me again another year before I even set that blog up. So oh, it wow. took me one year to realize that I set the wrong blog up. So oh, no. Because, you know, I, I, had the right, I, I had a blog before, so I knew that I wanted self-hosted. But in the time I was away from blogging, WordPress had come up with something that was in between self-hosted and you know, them hosting. So there was like this middle option. So I just thought that, oh, the paid option is what I'm going for because it's self-hosted. And then I said that, and then later I realized, oh no, I'm still being hosted by WordPress, which is not what I want. So then I had to redo that. And then it took me, I think, another year or two before I put up my first recipe post. So. Oh, wow. I yeah. Wasn't very efficient. Oh, and that's all right. I A lot of us have that as part of our story. I mean, in different forms. I look back and I'm like, whoa, I could have done things way more efficiently and way quicker, but whatever. I claim it as my story and I embrace it. So at what point did you put up your first blog post? Okay. So I, I actually researched all the dates for the podcast because, you know, there were so many like stops that I really couldn't remember. So I think, I think November 20, 2021 was my first blog post. So you're just coming up on a year. Wait, or maybe it was November 2020. Then? Okay. Yeah. Either way, a year or two in. <laughs> <laughs> but basically, I only really got serious in December 2021 because that's when I, you know, when I started actually producing content and doing keyword research and whatnot. So once you dug in, you applied some of the knowledge that you had acquired in business school to blogging. So can you talk through some of that, how it applies in our world? Okay, so I think like with a business school, is kind of like as, with SEO. So they always say, you know, it's not one big thing, it's many small things. And it's kind of the same with, you know, translating what I learned in the MBA. But I think if we divided it into themes, I think there would be five. So one is what gets you here won't get you there. And then another is investing and treating your blog like a business, which you've heard many times. And then the third one is diversification. The fourth is putting yourself out there. And the fifth is thinking about the consumer. So is there one that you want me to start with or should I just Let's start with number on? one. Okay, cool. So what gets you here won't get you there is the first thing they tell us when we get into OBS, which is that, you know, whatever skills we had that made them accept us is not going to get us the job we want. And I think it's the same with blogging. So before Mediavine, 
I was obsessed with traffic because, you know, everyone wants at 50K to get into Mediavine to earn some decent ad money. But now that I've joined Mediavine, it's not that I don't want traffic. I still want traffic, but I think about other things as well. So I don't always go for the highest volume keyword that I can rank for anymore. For example, you know, I will look at the RPM. So there's some topics that, you know, are said to have lower RPMs like cocktails. So I don't go for those. And then others that are like negative keywords. So like, for example, recently I found this keyword that had good volume and looked quite easy on key search, but it was some kind of cocoa bomb or chocolate bomb. And your bomb is a negative keyword Ah, in Mediavine. So I didn't go for that. I mean, I'm not saying I won't, but I can do a lot of other posts before I run out of posts to write about and then do this one. The low RPM thing is a big one. You have to be really careful about some of those words. Like I know a lot of people use like, these are killer brownies or... I mean, there's a handful of like violence related words and then also like like sexual content. Like there's things that can describe food that maybe shouldn't, right? Yep. <laughs> yeah. And you know how I know this? Because someone told me my blog got blocked in their office for being a porn site. Oh my gosh. <laughs> so I really have to look at the language on my blog, I think. Wow. Yeah, that's huge and something that slips under the radar for a lot of us. I didn't know this until recently either. And I went back and I was, I think the word that I kept finding in my low RPM post that was being flagged was, I think, okay, don't quote me on this, but I think it was delectable or desirable or something like that, that kind of ha- could allude to something else. So well, I just replaced it nice, and my RPMs went up. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to look into those words as well. Because, you know, I use the media vine list, but they don't mention that. And I can see how that might be suggestive to right. suggestive. Yeah. yeah. Okay, anything else on your um, point about what got you here won't get you there? Oh, so, and then, for example, before media vine, I would never touch a top three post. But now I just look, I look at the RPM. So sometimes, you know, one of my top three posts actually has really, really low RPMs. So now, I mean, what's my purpose with the post? My purpose is not the traffic anymore because now I'm in Mediavine, right? My purpose is to earn money from the post. So if the RPM is low, I should still update it even though it's a top two post. And, you know, people might disagree, but that's my approach at the moment. And has that paid off for you? I mean, have you ever had a moment where you're like, oh, shoot, I wish I wouldn't have touched that? Well, so because I only very recently got into Mediavine, so there hasn't been enough data to do a comparison. But, you know, if you ever re-invite me back on the show, I promise to share all the data with you. We'll get an update then. All right. Anything else about that first point? So I think, you know, that's about the main thing about thinking about, you know, what got you here and then what you need to get to where you want to go from now on. So the second point was, you know, investing and treating your blog like a business, which so many people say. And I mean, like, they're the obvious things. So I did an SEO audit of Casey Markey, and, you know, I thought that was really good. And that's really what helped me get into media buying because, you know, it showed me this yellow brick road to follow. Yeah. But I think there's some less obvious stuff as well. So, like, for example, I think with blogging, sometimes there's a group or bloggers that, you know, pride themselves on never having paid for anything, never having bought a prop, mm. never having taken a course, never having taken a cool a tool, sorry. I was gonna say that's cool and you know, that's cool, but I think it might not work for everyone. And I think sometimes what we're not paying in money, we're paying for in time. You know, I'm sure if given enough time, all of us could figure out what the course is and what not teach as well. But it's just gonna take you so much longer to learn it rather than just pay someone to teach you. I love this point. I, if you listen to the podcast, which I know you do, Jen, I this is huge for me. I have really good friends who are bloggers who are like exactly what you're describing. They're like, I don't pay for anything and I figure it out. But my question is, how long does it take you though to get to where you want to go on your path if you're not investing in learning and like as much as you can, right? This is such an important point. What else about that? Oh, so I was just going to say, I totally agree with you. I'm always looking for new things to invest in, which doesn't mean I invest in everything because, you know, I like to make data decisions. And I think sometimes the things you invest in don't have to be super obvious. So like, for example, like props. So I do latte posts. And one of my friends actually called me out for bad photos because she said, why are you always doing a top-down post, a shot? And the reason I do that is because I don't have one of those clear glasses so that you can see the nice layers in the latte. So, you know, I think I really should invest in that. Right. A little detail, but yeah. And then other things about treating your blog like a business, I think is like having processes. So, you know, when you have a corporate career, in a way, it's quite easy because someone else has already thought about all these things and they have come up with the standard operating procedure that you just have to follow. But, you know, when you're a blogger or you're doing a small business, you don't have that map. You need to figure it out yourself, even if your business is super small. You know, you need to just work, work, work out what works for you or your business. So, for example, like for keyword research, I realized that I was always getting seduced by these keywords that don't fit my niche but look super rankable, you know, and writing about that, which is not great. 
So I've actually started this flowchart to help me determine whether or not I should go after a keyword. And I think the good thing about having that is that, you know, in future, if you want to hire out a job, so like if I want someone else to write the polls or to do the keyword research, they have all the processes to follow. Oh, that's smart. I love that idea. Anything else on investing? Like what other things, if people are listening and they're like, well, what should I be investing in? Do you have thoughts on that? So for investment, like, you know, I've said that we should invest, but obviously they're now like, so many courses out there it doesn't mean you should take every one so I often ask for recommendations in groups and I see lots of people do that too but it doesn't mean like I just take you know every every suggestion that comes up so you know I need to see that you know lots of people there's a trend lots of people have taken it and recommended it or more importantly I want to know you know the concrete proof that the traffic improve or the revenue improve after the course and so that's actually why I started doing my reviews of some of the courses and tools I took so I actually go into the really granular detail. I don't just say my traffic improved. I say like after taking the course, I got like 50% more clicks. But then, you know, what are these 50% more clicks? Maybe because I took the course, I wrote more posts. So that's why I have more clicks. So then I go into how many clicks per post before and after the course. So, you know, if I'm getting more clicks on average per post, then I know the course is good for me. So that's something I did with like key search and with cooking with keywords and, you know, rank IQ and a couple of other things that I tried. Yeah. People like those details. I think that speaks volumes when you can get as nitty gritty with the numbers as possible. People can make a better decision when they hear those numbers. Well, I think it also helps me like keep track of my pro- my mm-hmm. progress. You know, yeah, definitely. Any other investments that you recommend? Well, I mean, so I you know mentioned that you know I really like cooking with keywords. I my SEO audit was great. Rank IQ. You know, I think you mentioned that a lot as well. So mm-hmm. yep, it's familiar to the listeners. Yes. Oh, all great investments. Anything to do with, I feel like, finding that SEO or keyword research tool that you really trust and like and know and just digging into it, whether it's key search or rank IQ or whether it's getting an audit or whatever, like figuring that out, I think, is a huge piece of the whole puzzle. I think it is. And also like trusting the person you're paying. So like, I'm not saying like, you know, putting your brain to sleep and not thinking about yourself. But, you know, if I paid someone, then I should take his advice and try it before deciding, you know, I want to do something else. Mm, That's a good one. Yep. Completely trusting, implementing, and then move on to the next thing. Yeah, that's great. Okay. Are you through investing? Anything else on that before we move to diversifying? No, I'm very happy to talk about diversification. Okay, yeah, go for it. So, you know, diversification in two things, one in your traffic sources and the second in income. So like previously, I was just focused on SEO. But now that, you know, I've made it to Mediavine, I'm getting a bit concerned about being hit by a Google update. So I've started to look into other sources like Pinterest and, you know, Facebook and whatnot. And then for income, so... I think, you know, a lot of us know that Google is actually going to do away with third party cookies. And obviously, we all hope that our ad earnings will not be affected. But I was talking to one of my friends who also did MBA. And she was saying that actually, this is what happened to Facebook. They got rid of the third party cookies. And now their revenue is down by a lot. So even though I hope that it's good news for us, I think we should be prepared. So I started to look at diversifying income. And actually, I'm actually thinking of starting a second blog, which has more like affiliate potential. Because, you know, with a cooking blog, if I sell you a piece of cheese on Amazon, I think I get paid like a couple of cents. Yeah. So what is your focus of... For the second blog? Yeah. Okay. So I've got two ideas and one is a travel blog about Korea because before I did my MBA, I was selling Korean beauty products. So I've been there many times, you know, and I really like the country and, and, you know, travel, you get good affiliate with the air tickets and the hotels and whatnot. And then a second one would be maybe doing a DIY site again because, you know, I, I really enjoy that as well. And it kind of ties in with the recipes as well. Hey there, jumping in for a quick break to talk about Rank IQ. I love this keyword research tool and you've heard me talk about how much it has helped me to grow my traffic on my food blog. I'd love to share one of the reasons I love this tool so much, which is how fast I can kick out a post. Here is why it's faster. Number one, the Rank IQ Optimizer is an incredible optimizer and provides very specific recommendations about content to include inside the post while allowing me to write my own posts in my own words from my own perspective and with my unique experience and expertise. This makes the writing process go really smoothly and the optimizer acts as my guide, leading the way to a comprehensively written post. Number two, I don't do as much searching when deciding on a keyword, so I dig into the writing portion really quickly and with laser focus. Number three, I dive into each post with confidence because each keyword has been handpicked by the creator of the tool, Brandon, 
versus having some automated robot to do it. With other tools, I approach each keyword with much more trepidation because I honestly have no clue how it will perform or whether it is worth my time and energy. Go to rankiq.com to sign up and check it out for yourself. Now back to the episode. And then with the DIY site, you could use that to promote more specific uh, affiliates, right? I think more like equipment because, you know, you get Mm -hmm. paid more if they buy like a big ticket item. So like, for example, there's something called CryCut, which is kind of this printer that prints out, which kind of like, I think, laser cut designs for you. So, you know, you get a bigger commission if someone buys that printer. Right. Yeah. Like you mentioned, if someone purchases, I don't know, a can of beans that you recommend on Amazon (laughs) affiliate program, you get like three cents and that does not add up very quickly. So those bigger ticket items would probably produce a lot more revenue, I can see. Yep. And actually one of my MBA classmates was in charge of this affiliate system thing in Amazon, but she didn't really want to tell me all the details, but she did say that there are some bloggers earning millions from the affiliates and her advice was just to concentrate on the big ticket items and to do like roundups. So, you know, like the 10 best XYZ of 2021. Ooh, that right there is a great tip. I love that. Okay, I love that. Anything else about diversifying, whether it's income or platforms? That's about it in general. I mean, if you have specific questions, I'm happy to take them. Okay. How much do you recommend diversifying on platforms? You mean as in traffic? Yeah. So like to diversify between Pinterest and Facebook and Instagram doesn't provide a lot, but there and your blog. Uh, well, so I mean, I greatly recommend diversification because you know, you hear so many bloggers who get hit by a Google update and then their traffic just tanks. And I think it's, you feel less stressed if you know that you have something else to rely on. Yeah, that is so true. Pinterest is not dead. I know a lot of people don't like Pinterest right now because it's changed so much in the past couple of years. It's not what it used to be. But I think that my opinion stays that Pinterest is such a visual platform. People love getting recipes on Pinterest. So I feel like that is a no-brainer. If you're a food blogger, you should be dedicating some time to Pinterest, even if it's just a little bit, but just my opinion there (laughs) thrown in. I do pin every day now, actually, but I must confess, I never actually did Pinterest before this. And the reason was because when I had a DIY blog and I used to search on Pinterest, I loved looking, using it to look at photos. But when I search, I would search for like a skirt and I'll get shown a shoe or, you know, if I <laughs> click the link, it would just bring me to somewhere not related. So to me, the search didn't seem to work. So then I thought that it didn't work for other people. And that's why I think like a community is important because, you know, like I think a few years ago, Pinterest was actually bringing bloggers lots of traffic, but I didn't know that because my search process was just not working. Yeah. I mean, every platform is a learning curve, right? And you just have to dig in a little bit and see what works for you. Okay. What about tip number four, putting yourself out there? What do you have about that? So I think, you know, we need to lean into what's uncomfortable. So I'm actually not only introverted, I'm super shy and super reserved. So, you know, before the MBA, I would never have pitched to you and say, can I come on your podcast? Mm -hmm. And, you know, I mean, I'll tell you a secret. I'm here because I I love listening to your podcast, but also because I really want the backlink. Yeah, it's huge. (laughs) I think that's a huge reason to come on. Absolutely. Yeah. And so I think, you know, if I still continue thinking I'm shy, I don't want to do this, then, you know, I'm never going to help myself. So we really need to do what makes us uncomfortable to help us grow. Yes. And if you you do more of it, it really gets more like second nature. So like before the MBA, I remember once I had to talk to my boss about something and we actually get on quite well, but because I was so shy, she actually thought I was breaking out on hives because I guess, you know, I was just so stressed about talking to her. But then during the MBA, we had like a couple of conferences. So like uh, there was one where I went to Morocco and then it was held by MIT. So we were pitching people about our business ideas. And then, you know, I really invested so much in paying for the MBA. So I just made myself go up on stage and pitch my business idea. And people were really encouraging. So I think, you know, just try doing what makes you uncomfortable, you know, and you'll be surprised. Yeah, you do get used to the discomfort and the discomfort becomes less and less the more you do it, like you mentioned. And by the way, here's a little side note. I believe that everyone listening should be on a podcast, if not more than one, because because of that, it pushes you out of your comfort zone. It also gives you backlinks. It allows you the opportunity to talk about things that you are knowledgeable about. It allows you to become connected with other people. It uh, yep. gains you new networking opportunities and things like that. So yeah, just a little side note. Everyone listening, go pitch a podcast that you would be great on and pitch Megan. Pitch me. Yes. Yes. And get on a podcast. I think it's great for everyone. What else about anything else about putting yourself out there and making yourself a little uncomfortable? 
well, just two points. One is that if you're not uncomfortable, it means you're not growing. So that's not good. No. And then secondly, Megan is so encouraging when you picture. So please picture. Yay. I love that. Do it. I hope to get a surge of pitches now after your episode is released, Jen. <laughs> well, let me know. Yes. Okay. And I wrote that you have a fifth point, but I didn't write down what it was. So remind me what that is. And then you can chat about that one. Okay, so uh, the fifth point was actually thinking about the consumer. So I think we are always getting told, like, you need to think about your blog reader and solving their problems. But I think we should also put ourselves in the shoes of the consumer. So actually, we are also consumers. So, for example, when you think about which social media platform to, to concentrate on, you need to think about what kind of consumer are they looking for and does that fit your personality? So to my point about how, you know, I was on Instagram before doing SEO, you know, I realized that I used to gripe to people that I wasted so much time on Instagram. But then actually, I realized that's not true. I didn't actually waste time. I just wasn't taking full use of the opportunities it was giving me because I'm not the right consumer for them. So I heard in this top hat rank webinar that, you know, Instagram is like the bar and I'm not really the right customer for the bar. So when I was on Instagram, I actually got asked to be on two TV shows. One is Channel News Asia, which is like CNN for Asia. And then another was this British reality TV cooking show, which is kind of like the home cooking version of Great British Bake Off. And you know, if I had taken them, you never know. My blog might have become really successful, but I did take them. Ah. So, uh, you know, that's my point. You should lean into discomfort. And secondly, you should also think about whether you are really the person who's going to take advantage of, you know, the chances that that social media platform offers to you. Wow, that's so cool. I love that, that you shared that. Yeah, you just never know, right? Mm -hmm. All right. Anything else about that last point that you want to mention? Well, now I just have like lots of little points about, you know, what I learned from the MBA, yeah, uh, which are not themes. Okay, so one is related to Instagram. So I think one thing that would have been useful was that having a stop loss. So in stock trading, you are encouraged to actually have this price that you, you will sell it when your stocks fall in price. So for example, you know, before I buy Apple, I know that, you know, if it hits 30, I'm going to sell it. And the reason for that is because there's this escalation of commitment. So people invest, they get a negative ret- return. And what do you think they do? Share. <laughs> so they invest again. And you know, oh, in right, economics, yeah. that is so irrational. You just made a loss. Why are you buying some more of the loss making stock? And that's because people, you know, they're loss of us. They don't want to give up on it. Mm. So, you know, with Instagram, you know, I was on it for years, just trying and never giving up. So I think, for example, now I'm moving to TikTok. But before I move in, I'm thinking, you know what? Buy when, if I don't get X number of followers, then I am going to give up on this platform. Oh my gosh. I think we all need to listen to this a little more because you're so right. We just are like, with each passing year, we're like, well, maybe this year, maybe th- maybe if I tweak this, maybe if I do this. But then like year after year after year, it just doesn't move anywhere. So we should put our sights elsewhere. True. Oh, you change what you're doing. Yeah, that's a great point. Okay, what other little tips do you have? Uh, then one, I guess, is like, you know, and I think we mentioned this about the importance of networking, you know, and having that community. So as I mentioned, because, you know, I had a DIY blog when I was in the MBA and nobody in the MBA was into blogging. And so I think that it just made it harder to amplify like my efforts with the blog, which is why I immediately looked for Facebook groups when I started the food blog and I found Food Blogger Central. And that's what led me to Casey Maki, which led me to Cooking with Keywords, which led me to Media Vine. And because, you know, I really believe in community. And it's really interesting. When I was in business school, I hated networking because I thought it was really fake. <laughs> but I actually love blogging, networking. Like, And I think about it more like community building rather than, you know, it's tit for tat networking. If that makes sense? Yeah. So actually, I pitched so many Facebook groups and I wouldn't have done this before, you know, when I was shy. And I just told them, you know, I find blogging can be isolating. You know, if you're looking for people to be like your blogging colleagues, because we don't have that anymore, you know, maybe we can start a WhatsApp chat. And I got inundated with replies. So I got like thousands of replies. Wow. Just a note about what you said, business networking. When you said those words, I was like, oh, I kind of clinched up because I remember those conferences that I used to have to go to in the corporate world that were like super stuffy and uncomfortable and not genuine. And yes. networking in the food blogging space is so different than that. I think in like food blogging, we all want to really help each other world. And, yeah. you know, business, everyone's like, what can I get from you? What can you give right. me? Yeah. Right. That's so true. Yeah. Such an important piece of the whole puzzle, that networking and community piece. Do you have recommendations about where to start? You mentioned that you started in the Food Blogger Central. Do you have any have any other places to go to get started with that? Oh, I do have one and it's my own. So I told you that I pitched like all these groups and got these thousands of replies. So I messaged these thousands of people and only hundreds replied of the hundreds. So then I sorted out many groups and we said we'll do calls. And I think only two calls happened. 
Oh. And the reason is because, firstly, I think, you know, when people, people might be interested, but they're not so committed. And secondly, because of the timing thing. Because, oh, you know, we're all yeah. spread around the world. So what I, I did was I started a Facebook group called Connecting Bloggers. And my plan is to start a weekly or monthly community building. I'm staying away from networking here. Call. Yeah. And then whoever can make it just signs up for it on that day. So, you know, you, we don't have to set like, because I think with most like accountability or mastermind groups, there's a set time and you have, you know, it might be 2 a.m. your time or, you know, 5 a.m. your time if you make it. But now I'm just putting out like various timings every month. And then if you want to be there and you can make it, you just sign up. Oh, great idea. I love that. So we'd love to have you, Megan, if you want to join us. Oh my gosh. I love that idea. That's such a new perspective on how to do that. Amazing. Chili was inspired by somebody who came on your podcast. Oh. So I think it's, I might be spelling, I'm saying her name wrong. It's, I think it's Elia. She does email marketing and she does a monthly roundtable on Zoom, I think, and it's shared on YouTube. And I got an invitation to it and I was like, this is so clever. So I thought I should do the same thing for food blogging. Oh my gosh, I love not, that. Not that I'm going to put the video on YouTube, by the way, so nobody here has to be worried. Right. <laughs> All right, do you have any other little tips for us, Jen? Okay, so I mean, I do have a, just a couple of small things here and there. So, yeah. you know, if it gets too like granular, do feel free to stop me. Go for it. So one thing we learned in business school is that, you know, do you think choices are good or bad? Oh gosh, that is a loaded question. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. What is your thought? Well, I think, you know, as consumers, we say we want choice. We want lots of choice, right? Yeah. But actually, too much choice is bad. It's mm. bad for the consumer and it's bad for the company selling your product because people can't make a decision. Yeah, right. It's complicated, right? It makes it more complicated. Yep. Yeah. And so like when I was doing my newsletter very recently, I, you know, at first I was like, no, I have to give them lots of choices. Maybe they just want dessert recipes or they just want bubble tea, you know, or they want savory. And so then I had all these choices. Then I remember, wait, too much choice is bad. So then I just thought, what are the really important sections I have to have, which is all recipes, vegan recipes. Because, you know, if I send a vegan a pork recipe, I don't think they're going to be staying yeah. on my mailing list. And then the third one is the life of the food blogger, because I don't think they're here for my recipes. So then I just had these three simple segments. I love that. Simplicity goes a long ways. Yep. It makes our life easier, too, because then you don't have to manage so many streams. Yes, that is true. It simplifies it for the user, but also for us, right? So all around, yeah. And it just brings more clarity, I think. Like, what am I really good at? What is worth delivering? What's Where's the value here? So yeah, yep. good message. All right, what else do you have? Okay, so two last points. And the second last is, so one thing we learned in organizational behavior is they were looking at what makes a successful team. And one thing they identified was that all these teams had early successes. So then when I thought about blogging, I started this thing where now I write down all my milestones so that, you know, because I think all of us, we go through these parts of the journey where we want to give up. You know, we think that, you know, Google hates us, you know, it's not giving us love. We've done it for years. It's not going anywhere. But then before you give up, look at your milestones and maybe that will convince you to continue your journey. Oh my gosh. This is like the, have you read, Do you, are you a business book reader? I was, but the last, but this whole year, I've just been so focused on the blog. I haven't had time yeah. to do anything outside the blog. Yeah, fair enough. So there's a book called The Gap in the Gain by Dan Sullivan. It is so good. And it's about this whole concept. It's one of my favorite new business books that I've read. But yeah, like when you look back and you look at the progress that you've made in any area of your business or life, that is more powerful than looking ahead to what you haven't done yet. And that can be a huge game changer. So that reminded me of this concept that you were just talking about. I will check that book out. And thanks for sharing that. So I know that I wasn't just regurgitating nonsense. <laughs> Someone else has actually written a book about it. So it must be, you know, a good tip to share. It is so good. It's, it's an amazing book. You'll love it. What is your last tip for us, Jen? So my last one is about comparison and competition. So I think like, you know, we're always being told not to compare. And I think in the ideal world, we won't compare ourselves. But in reality, we all compare ourselves. We, we hear about someone who does it better or quicker or whatnot than us. And we think, oh dear, I suck. So I think to manage this, you need to know who your real competitors are. So one reason I gave up my DIY blog was because I felt that there was no traction. But actually now, I think 20,000 views wasn't bad for that time. I think at that time, I could almost have gotten into Mediavine because that was 25,000, mm. right? Then. But because the only people I knew about doing this were like people like, honestly, WTF or PS I Made This. And they were all like in the millions of views. They were always in like the newspapers and they were getting brands, big brands working with them. So I felt like, oh no, I'm a loser. My blog's doing nothing because, you know, I can't match up with these people. So, you know, you need to compare yourself with your real competition, not with the outliers. 
And this goes back to your previous point too a little bit. Compare yourself with a previous version of you so yep. that you don't have to look outside of what you are doing necessarily. True, but sometimes looking at what your competition is also like healthy benchmarking. Mm-hmm. And you know, in the business world, they do do that. I'm not saying like, you know, compare yourself to someone else and feel terrible. But sometimes, you know, if you think it's not working for yourself and someone who started at the same time as you or is at the similar point in the journey, you can share tips or whatnot, you know, or just look at, you know, what that person's doing that you're not, that you might want to try. And... We talked about this a little earlier, just embracing that journey, even if it's been a messy one, even if you've made mistakes that have held you back for years like I have, mm-hmm. it's okay. That's my story. There's no way I can go back and change my story. Nothing in this world will allow that to happen. So what is resisting it going to do that's only going to cause me discouragement and, and you know, just being upset? And there's no point in that. So embracing whatever your journey is and moving forward. True. And maybe, you know, in those periods you were planting seeds and they haven't bloomed yet, but one day they will. Yep. That's an analogy I love to use too. Plant those seeds. They they are germinating beneath the surface even as we speak, right? Yep. Oh, this has been so good. Thank you, Business School, for giving Jen such clarity and value and wisdom. (laughs) I I will let them know if they ever invite me back as an alumni speaker. (laughs) Yes, you should. That's such a great idea. That would push you out of your comfort zone too, right? Only if they give the back link. Oh, yes. (laughs) Oh my gosh, that's funny. All right. Is there anything we're missing that you just wanted to make sure to touch on before we say goodbye? I think we've covered almost everything. Oh, this was so valuable. Thank you, Jen, for your time today. Really appreciate chatting with you and connecting. This has been super fun. Thank you for taking a chance on me. Yeah. And for inviting me to be here. Oh my gosh, of course. Do you have a favorite quote or words of inspiration to leave us with today? Yep. So actually, this section really speaks to me because when I was a kid, I used to collect quotes. But I would just leave you with one, which is that it doesn't matter how slowly you go as long as you don't stop. You know, so it doesn't matter how slowly our blogging journey is. As long as we don't stop, we'll get there eventually. Oh, amazing. That fits in so well with our chat. Thank you. Thank you. We'll put together show notes for you, Jen. And if you want to go peek at those, you can go to eatblogtalk.com forward slash greedy girl gourmet. Tell everyone where they can find you online and social media, etc. So my blog is www.greedygirlgourmet.com and on all the social media except Twitter, because my name is too long, it's greedy girl gourmet. On Twitter, it's greedy girl G. All right. Oh, I just put that together. Why you're GGG on Skype. (laughs) That's funny. (laughs) All right. I'm a little slow sometimes. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. Go check out Jen. And thank you, Jen, for being here. Thank you so much for listening today, food bloggers. I will see you in the next episode. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Eat Blog Talk. If you enjoyed this episode, I'd be so grateful if you posted it to your social media feed and stories. I will see you next time.